Thank you very much for joining us here tonight, Mr. Collier. Um, together with Professor Kay, you recently wrote a book titled Greed is Dead, which is an apt play, of course, on the infamous words of Gordon Gekko. Um, in it, you mentioned that greed is no longer intellectually tenable. What do you mean by that? Yeah, thanks. Um, yeah, you're quite right. We're not saying at the moment uh, we, haven't, we got rid of greed. Um, we're saying we're at peak greed. Um, but a peak greed because um, the ideas which justified greed, which was the rise of individualism, um, and especially a misinterpretation of what capitalism is about, um, those ideas are no longer really tenable. Um, so uh, we go back to the, the workhorse of economics, um, uh, which is economic man, uh, a creature, a rather unattractive creature, conjured up in the 1950s. It's, in many respects, it's a very useful workhorse, but it was a, a drastic oversimplification of human nature. And um, economists at the time, in the 50s, really um, picked up on an exaggerated form of Darwinism, which said um, human beings are greedy and selfish and really not much else. Um, and if we're greedy and selfish, oh, and smart, smart, definitely smart. We overemphasize the smart bit, homo sapiens, sapiens, clever, clever. Um, and so if that was all we were, clever and greedy and selfish, um, you wanted the cleverest people at the top. So you needed these fantastically smart chief executives uh, to run, um, businesses and to run the state. And then um, you needed to try and get them to stop working just for themselves. So you needed to tie their performance to everything you could, to basically to the profits of the firm. Um, uh, and then they faced the problem that under them, all they could recruit was workers who were also greedy and selfish, but less smart. And so what you do, um, economics came to the rescue, principal agent theory designed in Oxford, um, which was monitor, scrutinize, um, and uh, tie carrots and penalties to scrutinize performance. That was, that was the working model. It was, became hugely influential. And that really took all power of decision up to the top. The chief executive knew best and beneath that, uh, you try to turn people as near to automata as possible. And so increasingly, that's how firms were, were run. And then in the 90s, the public sector started ape the private sector. If that's so good for the, public, for the private sector, we better do it too. And certainly in my own country of Britain, we transformed the public sector into that model of the top knows best, monitor, incentivize, scrutinize everybody else. And so uh, that stripped uh, ordinary people of the power of autonomy and decision. We ceased to be morally load-bearing uh, agencies. Uh, we became these, these, these awful creatures. Why is all that untenable? Um, Apart from being disgusting, um, it's, it's factually wrong. Modern evolutionary biology comes up with a very different picture of, uh, of what is human nature. As, as Professor Rajan was, was saying, we're designed to be very distinctive mammals. We're pro-social, much more so than other mammals. Um, we're creative, we're imaginative. The fuel of capitalism isn't greed. It's common purpose in a team which has the autonomy to experiment and innovate. That's the fuel of capital. The genius of capitalism is decentralization within a certain discipline of competition um, and the ability to come together. Um, in Greed is Dead, we've got a lovely example of Airbus. Airbus is a huge cooperation, um, just like an iPhone is a cooperation between an awful lot of firms. No one knows how to make an Airbus. No one knows how to make an iPhone. It's distributed knowledge across a lot of different teams 
all of which have had the the power to 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 to, to come up with 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 creativity and ideas, but that depends upon de-strength, decentralizing. Yeah. So we've been trapped in a very dysfunctional model. Yeah. Well, that's a very comprehensive answer, Mr. Collier. I think that's a very apt uh, um, uh, part of your, you know, it's, it's actually the entire book you just mentioned in a couple of minutes. So what more questions can I ask? But um, I have, uh, if I understand you correctly, this idea of economic men, is that kind of a, a view on humanity or fellow men, which has been conjured up in the 1950s, a certain Darwinistic outlook on life. And this view on humanity has shaped our beliefs over the last few decades, uh, the way we look at ourselves, the way we look at society. Do I understand you correctly? Yeah, I mean, it's a very useful model for some purposes. It just got way above its pay grade. Um, and so, um, it, you know, I, I believe in simplifying wherever possible. Um, and so, it's a, for some purposes, it's a very handy simplification. Um, but it's been applied to everything, um, and and that that's where it became damaging. Um, I mean, what you haven't yet talked about um, is the is the community stuff. Um, that uh, that indeed Professor Rajan talked about, and which which is the basically the subject of the future of capitalism as well. Um, these spatial uh, and new class divides um, between a booming metropolis and broken cities, um, between the rising value of people with a good tertiary education. Uh, who went into fancy skills that became more and more valuable, like lawyers and bankers, versus the people with less education who um, specialized in manual skills, which have become less and less valuable. Now, as yeah. Professor Rajan says, um, the, the globalization of markets, which produces a lot of economic benefit overall, produces both winners and losers. Um, the business of public policy is to offset those losses, um, not reverse globalization, that would be dumb, um, but design policies which offset the losses. We fail to do that. We fail drastically. And so technology and globalization, which should have led to all boats rising, they're wonderful things. Um, you know, the living standards could be rising at about 2% a year, probably. Instead, um, major groups of people are very, very fearful of the future. The young, the old, uh, and, um, and, and the, 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 the manual workers. Yeah. They're the most fearful groups. And of course, they mutiny in various ways. Um, who, who benefits from this? Uh, the people who spotted the mutinies earliest, which is the, the, the mavericks. Uh, mavericks of the left, like Corbyn in Britain. Mavericks of the right, like Trump. Um, the one thing that the mavericks have in common is they're selling snake oil. And so the, the dispossessed are stuck with snake oil. Um, and meanwhile, the successful have peeled off from their obligations to others because they created a new identity, an identity of the successful. And they identify with each other, not with fellow citizens. And that peeling off of the successful. So if the unsuccessful, the defining characteristic is snake oil. The defining characteristic of the successful is smug. There's a complacency that says, we're all right and you don't matter. And that disgusting distancing from obligations to others in society, that has been the real tragedy uh, around our own societies. So have both elites on, say, the left side of the political spectrum and the right side of the political spectrum, so to say, free-rided on the strength of communities over the last decades? Strength of community has gradually been fading. Yeah. Um, 
It was the secret source that a lot of societies inherited um, after the first, after, after the Second World War, and um, and that uh, led to uh, a, a quarter century from about 1945 to 1970, which was an astonishing era of success. Um, people were, were were experienced in bearing obligations. They just fought a war together. They'd struggled together. Uh, and so politicians were addressing the anxieties of ordinary people, and the technology and the trade was uh, was was producing a lot of potential for mutual success. And so, indeed, that was a period when all boats were rising. Um, if we look back on that, it was a period of remarkable achievements at every level. Global common purpose, that was the period of the... IMF, where uh, Professor Rajan worked, the World Bank, where I work. Um, so global common purpose um, and, and the formation of Europe um, as, a, as a common entity. Uh, it was an astonishing period of achievement. Um, uh, and, uh, and then it all started to fall apart. It fell apart with the rise of individualism, the peeling off of the successful, the departure of politics from being about practical anxieties into disputes about ideology between factions of the elite. And so, despite the promise of rapid technology growth and all of globalization can deliver, what we've actually got is these deaths of despair and uh, and the fears of of the young, the most in the, in Europe, um, youth is even more fearful than in America, which is saying something. Thank you, Mr. Collier. Let's move on to the discussion part of this uh, of tonight.